We believe that all men are created equal. To the magnificent mosaic that is America. A radio beacon, two radio beacons. I have a dream. Today. Change has come to America. Believe me, help is on the way. Knock, knock. Who's there? Hey! It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Roach Show. Turn up your mind. The number of open FBI domestic terrorism investigations this year has increased significantly. According to an unclassified summary of the March intelligence assessment, the two most lethal elements of the domestic violence extremist threat are racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists and militia violent extremists. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocated for the superiority of the white race. Again, we're being warned by the Attorney General this time of the United States of America. Christopher Wray has warned us, the, uh, uh, the, the, the FBI director, he's warned us that the number one threat that we face as Americans are Al Qaeda, the base, uh, white supremacists and uh, militia guys, right? It's just like, uh, so Merrick Garland gave us a, um, a blueprint basically for uh, co- combating, check this out, domestic extremism. Yeah, Al Qaeda has moved in and they're not from another country. They're homegrown. They're here. They're, they're, they're our, our fellow citizens is what it is. I mean, this is unbelievable. So, so today, Merrick Garland uh, gave a very long um, explanation of what the blueprint for combating domestic extremism in this country should look like. This was uh, a much anticipated, much awaited discussion uh, that Merrick Garland had with us today uh, after Joe Biden had ordered a review of all of our federal agencies uh, to tell us what's going on with domestic extremism in this country. Biden wrote um, in the strategy document that was released today, quote, we cannot ignore this threat or wish it away, preventing domestic terrorism and reducing the factors that fuel it, demand a multifaceted response across federal government and beyond. And so what we're going to now do is we're going to enter into information sharing with technology companies to and and expand our hiring of intelligence analysts to improve the screening of government employees for their ties to domestic terrorism uh, to look at our recruitment of military personnel. I don't know if you saw this or not, but in the New York Times, there's a story about how military weapons are disappearing and they're being recovered, found, discovered at crime scenes across this country. So we have an internal problem is what it is. Now, the thing that's missing from all of this is a law, a domestic terrorism law. We don't have one. We don't have one. And the reason we don't have one is because we haven't been able to figure out how to separate somebody who is poised to commit domestic terrorism violence and someone who talks about committing violence. We don't want to infringe on privacy rights of domestic terrorists. We do want to infringe on privacy rights of childbearing aged women. That we have no problem with. Just let's get right up in there. Let's just get right up in there and protect that embryo, protect that fetus. But when it comes to sitting at a keyboard and typing out digital threats, now we uh, haven't figured out a way to uh, not infringe on somebody's right to privacy. It's just so unbelievable. But, you know, we've had uh, all kinds of domestic terrorism in this country. I, I mean, people know that you know, we had a fatal shooting of five police officers in Dallas. We had a shooting at a congressional baseball game. That was done by a, a Democrat or a guy who identified as being, uh, you know, anti-Republican, let's just put it that way. I don't think they've ever figured out what that guy's problem was, for real, but we do know that he asked 
all the people, uh, you know, this was when Steve Scalise was uh, shot. He asked everybody at that baseball game if they were Republicans before he shot them. So we know that that was uh, uh, something in his head. We know that that was a factor in his attack. Okay. But now we've got like uh, domestic terrorists that seriously, you know, wear it on their, you know, clothes. I mean, they have patches and they wear KKK, you know, insignia and they walk with the Confederate flag through the Senate after they breach it and, uh, you know, uh, beat police officers senseless and crush them and, uh, you know, uh, uh, drag them and tase them. By the way, I have to tell you, you know, Ron Johnson, Wisconsin, I'm not sure what the hell you're going to do about this mistake, but Ron Johnson sounds exactly, I mean, what is this? Oh, Ron Johnson sounds exactly like Vladimir Putin when it comes to talking about a terrorist attack on the U.S. Capitol. I just, I want to play you these, uh, these two clips side by side, okay? This is Vlad. This is Vlad. You know, everybody's talking about this uh, summit or whatever it is. It's going to be two separate press conferences so that, uh, I don't know, Biden can go tell Vladimir Putin, uh, you know, what a pain in the ass he is, basically, I guess, and lay out some red lines that he's going to tell Vlad you can't cross. And Vladimir Putin is probably going to deny that the hacking ever even occurred. He's going to deny that he has done anything, uh, you know, against, uh, you know, uh, uh, Navalny, that, you know, uh, Navalny is uh, just like the insurgents uh, that breached the Capitol. I mean, this is really uh, Putin's defense. It's what about ism, right? When you ask Putin about the, the poisoning of Navalny, the jailing of of Navalny, the cruel torture. So Navalny had to go on a hunger strike to draw attention to his incarceration for being a an opposition, you know, a a guy who opposes Vladimir Putin and wanted to run against him was actually politically engaged and running against Putin. He wasn't armed and dangerous. He wasn't beating police officers. He wasn't uh, hurting people. He wasn't, you know, tasing police officers. But, uh, you know, Vlad had him poisoned, right, and then jailed after he survived. And so when he was asked about that, he said, well, what about the insurgents at the Capitol? What about arresting protesters in America? What about that? I want to ask you, did you order the assassination of the woman who walked into the Congress and who was shot and killed by a policeman? Do you know that 450 individuals were arrested after entering the Congress, and they didn't go there to steal a laptop. They came with political demands. 450 people... We're talking about the capital riots. In our interview, President Putin often changing the subject to his criticism of America. Isn't that persecution for political opinions? There you go again, Mr. President. What about America when I've asked you about Russia? Yeah, and so what does he bring up? Just what the insurgents in this country bring up, okay? Just exactly what they bring up, Ashley Babbitt. That is what Vladimir Putin pointed to. Uh, The killing of Ashley Babbitt, who obviously had uh, five guns pointed at her after she was climbing through a broken window and and, and trying to enter onto the the floor of uh, the house, right, in order to stop the certification of a free and fair election, right? That is what the insurgents in this audience will do too. The what about isn't, what about Ashley Babbitt? What about Ashley Babbitt? Ron Johnson does the same damn thing, the same thing. We've seen plenty of video of people in the Capitol and and they weren't rioting. It it doesn't look like an armed insurrection when you have people that breach the Capitol and I don't condone it, but they're staying within the rope lines in the rotunda. That's not what an armed insurrection would look like. Isn't it amazing how Ron Johnson parrots Vladimir Putin's talking points just with such ease and and effortlessly? No, they didn't stand in the rotunda. They were crushing police officers in the hallways. They were hunting Mike Pence. They were hunting Nancy Pelosi. They were running through the Capitol offices asking, Nancy, where are you? All things Randy at RandyRhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. 
Let me go through this newly announced government plan. It contains four pillow, pillars. The first pillar is for agencies across government to really understand and analyze and share information about the full range of domestic terrorism threats nationwide, even those threats that could be influenced by foreign actors. Now, this includes a new system that will be developed by the FBI and DOJ that will track these domestic terrorism cases nationwide. So then there's the second pillar here, and it allocates $77 million to state and local law enforcement partners to really thwart domestic terror threats before they even emerge. It prevents domestic terrorism recruitment and mobilization, and it works with communities. And it even includes a commitment from the Department of Defense to train and alert service members or retiring military that they could be targeted by violent extremist actors. Since, of course, we've heard from prosecutors after January 6th, that some of those charged were former military and even current police officers from across the country. How sad is that? How sad is that? That people in a position of trust are part of an insurgency, part of a terrorist organization, that they are domestic terrorists trying to uh, break this country into into shards. I mean, it, 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 and there are transnational actors, uh, there are you know, domestic extremists here in the United States who are reaching out to transnational connections because individuals in Russia and Hungary, uh, Viktor Orban's Hungary, Poland, they are very um, ideologically connected uh, in that they believe in white supremacy, they believe in autocracy, they uh, don't believe in free and fair elections. They don't trust their neighbors or their friends and family anymore. So, I, you know, the Department of Treasury here has to get involved now to, to, to track money that's being uh, uh, funneled into, you know, the United States to support white supremacists in this here country. Uh, there's a uh, $100 million that will be in the two, 2022 budget for the hiring of new prosecutors and investigators and analysts. I mean, I, I just can't believe the amount of money uh, that, that we're going to have to spend on, on, on finding, uh, you know, the next Dylan Roof or, or, or finding, you know, like the next Marjorie Taylor Greene. So everybody's wondering, like, why did Marjorie Taylor Greene suddenly apologize for her anti-Semitic remarks about Jewish space lasers and masks, uh, you know, are the same as... Uh, you know, the, the, the golden star. I mean, you know, gold stars are good things. She meant the yellow star of David. And she apologized yesterday because apparently she got caught. Apparently she is targeted and got caught being somebody who perpetuates the big lie, perpetuates fraud, perpetuates anti-Semitism, perpetuates white supremacist narratives, and uh, the violence that uh, naturally comes from these fraudulent conspiracy theories. QAnon yesterday, uh, the FBI warned yesterday, Christopher Ray, who's testifying right now up on Capitol Hill. Chris Ray is in front of uh, Carolyn Maloney's uh, oversight committee in the House. I have it running in the background here, so if uh, anything gets uh, interesting, we can go to it, but uh, we're monitoring it. Uh, but. Yesterday, Chris Ray from the FBI warned our lawmakers that the QAnon people uh, are planning on becoming more violent. So you have now the Attorney General of the United States coming forward saying, uh, the problem is not Antifa, which Trump, member Trump, wanted to supp suppress any investigation into his supporters, including an up to the insurrection on January 6th, which Mitch McConnell does not want to investigate. You know why? Because they were part of it. And now there's emails, hundreds of them, that show clearly that the Trump administration was using the Department of Justice to nullify the results of the election based on, you know, his, his, his entire theory, his operating theory, which was rejected by every single court. It wasn't what he was telling people who call me who think, was being investigated. Well, it had nothing to do with fraud because there wasn't any. Rudy Giuliani, as I said yesterday, did not put any evidence before a court that suggested or showed or uh, uh, elucidated or claimed that there was fraud in the election because there wasn't any and Rudy wasn't willing to lose his law license. 
Sydney Powell didn't claim any fraud happened. She she tried to tell people, and Rudy tried to tell people outside of the court that they had mountains of evidence that was going to show that Dominion flipped votes in Michigan, and that you know uh, uh, there was Italian satellites that that were switching votes, and. Uh, they never presented any evidence of any of these conspiracy theory frauds because they never happened, number one. And number two, they weren't willing to lie to the court. So what has been told to people by these, sh- these shills for Trump, these liars, these, these, these people who are literally tearing our country apart with these allegations, uh, is a far cry from what they showed to the court they showed nothing to the court because there was nothing to show to the court and that's why they lost 61 times 61 times they lost but now there are emails and the emails show that rudy giuliani and his assistant and other people in that uh, crazy crazy group uh were trying to uh, get the justice department get the justice department involved and to get the justice department to write legal briefs to the supreme court because they wouldn't do it they wouldn't do it. And the Justice Department, this is why Bill Barr, we now know, this is why Bill Barr uh, just resigned. He, he had gone all the way. He wasn't going to go any further. He made his, his statement that the election was free and fair, and then he resigned. So Donald Trump uh, picked an acting attorney general named James Rosen. And James Rosen was written to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. And now those emails were released to the oversight committee, to Carolyn Maloney's committee, who then provided them, because they're not classified, provided them to the New York Times. And the New York Times went through them. And I'll just tell you, what's in them is just so amazing. Basically, there was this Rudy Giuliani ally who was peddling this outlandish conspiracy theory that there were Italian satellites that were somehow manipulating the vote counts here in the United States. And this person had asked uh, then acting attorney general Jeffrey Rosen to broker a meeting between this, this person and the FBI. And Jeffrey Rosen says, look, if this guy has any evidence, he can walk into the FBI's Washington field office and and tell them everything he knows. But then he gets so frustrated. And and this is what he writes to his number two at the Justice Department, Richard Donahue. He says, I flatly refused, uh, flatly refused to broker this meeting. I said, uh, said I would not be giving any special treatment to Giuliani or any of his witnesses and reaffirmed yet again that I will not talk to Giuliani about any of this. So the... And it, it, Italian satellites were flipping uh, votes. And, and, and you know what? It, it, even the acting director who was handpicked by Donald Trump to replace Bill Barr, who was also handpicked by Donald Trump. Because Bill Barr was willing to spy. He was willing to spy. That he would do. He could claim it was a leak investigation. And he could spy on Trump's enemies for him. And by the way, I just need to throw this in here. The inspector general who's been tasked with looking at the DOJ spying cannot interview ex-DOJ officials. Call in, connect. To speak to Randy, call 561-270-3844. 561-270-3844. Basically, there was this Rudy Giuliani ally who was peddling this outlandish conspiracy theory that there were Italian satellites that were somehow manipulating the vote counts here in the United States. And this person had asked uh, then acting attorney general Jeffrey Rosen to broker a meeting between this, this person and the FBI. And Jeffrey Rosen says, look, if this guy has any evidence, he can walk into the FBI's Washington field office and and tell them everything he knows. But then he gets so frustrated. And and this is what he writes to his number two at the Justice Department, Richard Donahue. He says, I flatly refused, uh, flatly refused to broker this meeting. I said, uh, said I would not be giving any special treatment to Giuliani or any of his witnesses and reaffirmed yet again that I will not talk to Giuliani about any of this. So the moment he figures out this guy is working on behalf of Rudy Giuliani, Jeffrey Rosen had had it and said he's absolutely not doing that. And then there was another moment where this really highlights the uh, anxiety within the Justice Department about how this was all going to play out. There was a January 3rd meeting in which a guy named Jeffrey Clark and then acting Attorney General Jeffrey Rosen and others went to the White House 
And Jeffrey Clark, um, who, was, who was at the time heading the civil division for the Department of Justice, was trying to convince the president to name him acting attorney general. Oh. And he was his pitch was basically, I, I can take this election fraud thing over the finish line. Pick me, pick me. Huh. And Jeffrey Rosen argued his case. And in the end, cooler, uh, you know, more legally sound minds won. And so afterward, after that meeting, which was, they were worried would be extraordinarily consequential, there was a conference call. And Jeffrey Rosen, uh, you know, and, and others uh, within the Justice Department breathed a sigh of relief. And then finally, there was another person within the Justice Department who says this in an email. Uh, it appears that the cause of justice, sorry, that, that full screen's a little far for me. Um, it sounds <laughs> like Rosen and the cause of justice won. So again, this big sigh of relief within the Justice Department, but we are talking about just three days before the riot. And again, what it shows is this evolution within the Justice Department. People are growing more and more frustrated by this relentless pressure, but in the end, they didn't break. They didn't break. But the fraud conspiracy theory was put out there by Rudy Giuliani over and over and over and over and over. And Sidney Powell and uh, Lynn Wood and Mike Lindell and Donald Trump himself, who still still plays that, uh, you know, that 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 fraud card. And it enrages, uh, you know, suckers out there who are born every minute, apparently, in this country. And, uh, you know, the ones that were born uh, and are voting age now uh, who are part of this QAnon digital army believe this stuff. And it's making them rage. It's making them violent. It's making them into domestic terrorists. Hence, Merrick Garland now has to put out a 32-page blueprint saying, all right, we got to get uh, local law enforcement involved. We have to have a partnership with uh, social media. We have to have uh, a, a, a look-see at the military recruitment. We have to have a look-see at ex-military guys who are leaving. Who We have to have a look at our own law enforcement people who believe this conspiracy crap. We have to take a look at every nook and cranny in American society that has been poisoned by Donald Trump's lies about he really won and we stole it from him, we being, uh, you know, uh, seven million more voters that did not vote for him. And we're in trouble. We're in big trouble. And this this crazy fraud has now sparked, like, uh, you know, legislatures across this country to introduce these voter suppression laws. Now, they're not doing it, these legislators, they're not doing it because they believe some fraud happened. They're just piggybacking on the emotion that fraud happened so that they can appoint themselves the arbiter of election results, meaning they're going to take away our voice. And the only time we really have one, the, 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 the day that Americans are the most powerful are on election days. That's when we have awesome power. A lot of people don't even appreciate the awesome power that they have on election days. Some of us do, and some of us do it so, uh, you know, forceful. Like when we vote, we like, you know, I mean, I just, you know, can't. Here, take it, take it, and feed it into the machine. You know, I get, and I want my sticker. I want my sticker. It's my power ranger sticker. You know what I mean? I just, uh, I've exerted my awesome power. Yeah, and a lot of people don't realize that there's real power in that. But Republican legislatures across this country do. They realize. And they see this big fraud and the rage by the 15% of the country that believes this crap. And by the way, the smaller the group, the harder they are to find. Right? So it is a very small group still that, uh, you know, believes this crap. But they're violent. And they're, 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 they're not taking, uh, you know, uh, uh, no for an answer. You know, I, they lost and they don't want to take no for an answer. They don't believe in democracy. They believe in autocracy. They want their guy, no matter who wanted somebody else, no matter how many more wanted somebody else. And the Republican legislatures are realizing that they've got a very shrinking population we we've gone over this i can't tell you how many times that the population of people who are willing to do this uh, yet again are ever smaller and so they are literally legislating away our voice by saying if they don't like the result of an election they will either ignore the result of the election and insert themselves with a different choice 
or they will ask for a second election and overturn the will of the people. You, you know, I, I have to tell you that in Missouri, I think it was, it was it Missouri, uh, it's in one of these articles. Here, it's this one. Um, okay, so there's a report. It's in the homework today. RandyRhodes.com slash homework will take you right to that page. It says, it, it says this is alarming, okay? And, then under, and this is the article that, that I'm talking about, the one that's in front of me. This is alarming. And then there's an actual report that is quoted in this article. The actual report is there too. It says, uh, read the report. And if you click on it, you will see a 32-page report called Democracy in Crisis. This report is, is freaky scary, okay? It is. The number of bills that are passing in uh, 24 states, I mean, they've tried in 41 states. 24 of these laws, okay, there were 148 pieces of legislation in 36 states. That grew to 216 pieces of legislation in 41 states, all to suppress the vote. 24 of those have become law. What they have done in these 24 pieces of legislation that have become law in various states is they are threatening election administrators with criminal penalties that are aggressive and in your face and replacing them, okay, saying if, if you help somebody to vote when you're not supposed to help somebody or if you mail a ballot to somebody who didn't request a ballot, it's a felony, okay? They're making criminal helping someone to vote. And they are also attempting to make legislators able to perform the core functions of an election and overturn the results if they don't like them. It's the Randy Rhodes Show. To speak with Randy, dial 561-270-3844. That's 561-270-3844. One of the things that uh, we saw in this, this is 230 pages of documents, is a private attorney going to the Department of Justice and saying, hey, I have this uh, this lawsuit we'd like you to file. This is modeled after some of the other Texas lawsuits, or the excuse me, the single other Texas lawsuit. Uh, you can file this. And the, pre the president has seen it. He's on board. Go ahead, uh, take that to, you know, take that to court. Take that to the Supreme Court. Yeah. Just a reminder, they have attorneys at the Justice Department who write their own lawsuits. They don't <laughs> need private attorneys to be peddling exactly. these lawsuits about election fraud. It is, it, it, the, the emails really highlight and, and bring much more detail to this idea that there was just a lot of hysteria within the White House at this time. Numerous outreach from Mark Meadows trying to convince the Justice Department to look into these allegations. I mean, it just went on and on. And again, in the end, you know, the Justice Department had just had it by uh, early January. So obviously, uh, they didn't need Rudy Giuliani. They didn't need private attorneys to write, uh, you know, uh, briefs to courts. If there had been fraud, the Department of Justice would have filed a fraud lawsuit on its own. Uh, and that is why Bill Barr left. That's why he said it was a free and fair election. And he checked out. And now we had this uh, acting guy come in. And the acting guy is also saying that to Rudy Giuliani, going, get out of here. There are no Italian satellites. Uh, nobody flipped any votes. We did a hand count in Michigan. Uh, Michigan actually did do a hand count after, uh, you know, uh, Sidney Powell and, uh, you know, uh, Rudy Giuliani said that there was this massive fraud, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and the hand count matched 100 percent to the machine count. So therefore, uh, everybody understood there was nothing going on with Italian satellites or vote switching or flipping or any of these things. OK, but still, Donald Trump was trying to subvert and nullify the results of the election. And so now in the next election, I, I, I think the only reason why it didn't succeed is because they did it after the fact. And you don't rig an election after the election. You rig it before the election. And every voter suppression person, every gerrymanderer, people who draw uh, rigged maps, they all know you, you put the fix in at the front, not at the back. This man was a moron. 
So that's exactly what's happening in legislatures, Republicans, uh, uh, legislatures across this country now. They're trying to improve the odds of stealing an election. They're trying to suppress the number of people that actually vote uh, by making it more difficult. No more, you know, you send a a mail-in ballot to somebody who didn't request one in some states, and the election official is going to be charged with a felony? A felony in places like Florida where... If you voted by mail before, you get a vote by mail ballot. You just do, you just get another one because you did it last time. And if you don't wanna vote by mail, what you do is you take that ballot that they sent you and you bring it with you and you vote in person. And if you forget to bring it, which has happened, then the poll worker calls the election supervisor and voids the mail-in ballot, and once that's confirmed, voided, that's when they give you the ballot to vote in person. I mean, the idea that, oh, no one knows what they're doing, and you know, it, it, that's so ridiculous. Well, because election supervisors know what they're doing, and because secretaries of state know what they're doing, the, the legislatures want to take away their ability to do the essential core mission of honest, free, fair, transparent elections. And they want the legislature, the legislators who are on that ballot to now have control of that ballot. What could go wrong? And let me just tell you something. Sometimes when you go to vote, this is what I was uh, getting to in Missouri, and it was Missouri. So here's a really simple example of uh, Republican legislature not liking what the voters voted for. In Missouri last year, on the ballot was a question of whether or not the voters of Missouri wanted to increase Medicaid eligibility. Okay, and that was a question on the ballot. That question was, it won, but yes, yes, they wanted to uh, increase Medicaid eligibility in Missouri. It won by 82,000 more votes. It was overwhelmingly supported by the voters. And the Republican-led legislature decided they didn't like that result, so they refused to fund it, even though the money comes from the feds, and it's free money. They refused to fund the proposal that the voters of Missouri proposed and voted for. The governor of Missouri, Mike Parson, withdrew his framework for Medicaid expansion in the state of Missouri under pressure from the Republican legislature after the people of Missouri voted in support of expanding Medicaid. That's what I'm telling you is going to happen to congressional seats, to Senate races. That's what's going to happen in presidential elections, in swing states like Florida, Arizona, Texas, which is getting very swingy. See, th- 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 this is this is the the fix being put in, and people who believe that somewhere along the line Trump actually won this damn election, which he lost by seven million votes and seventy four electoral college votes he lost by, wasn't even close. But he, throughout the whole month of December, and j- right before the insurrection. He was pressuring his Department of Justice to nullify the election, to nullify it. And the only problem I think that Bill Barr had was that they didn't do it on the front end, they were doing it on the back end, and he couldn't figure out a way to do it in a clandestine manner. And idiot Giuliani was papering the whole thing. He's sending emails to the Department of Justice, 236 pages of emails telling uh, the Department of Justice to, 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 to take this private attorney lawsuit, okay, and, and, and deliver it to the Supreme Court as if the Department of Justice wrote it. And the acting attorney general, this James Rosen dude who came in after Bill Barr said, I'm out, I'm not doing it. He also said, I'm out, I'm not doing it. This is a subversion of democracy itself. This is 
actually what the violent protesters were trying to do with violence. Now you have Republicans trying to do with law. They're trying to make it legal. Why? Because they need to improve their odds. People are voting in Republican states for things like Medicaid expansion. Well, we'll just not fund it, but what are we going to do about all these voters that want stuff? What are we going to do about them? Well, we have to suppress them from getting to the ballot box in the first place, and then in the second place, if we don't like the results, we have to give ourselves the power to overturn the results of the election. You know, we're not winning popular votes anymore. Why, even Donald Trump in 2016 lost the popular vote by 3 million votes, okay? The only thing that saved us in 2016 was the Electoral College, and now... That isn't even working for us. So we have to reverse all the progress we've made on accessing the ballot. We have to find ways to legally thieve. We have to find ways to legally steal. And so changing the rules at the outset to make the rejection of the popular will of the people is now becoming part of our legal process. It's, it's, it's limiting your voice is what it is. Now, you can sing and, and, and dance about free speech all day long. You could tell me, oh, well, when I uh, you know, tweet violent things and threaten people and harass people on social media, that's my right to free speech. Well, my right to free speech is nonviolent and non-harassing. It's using my vote. And when you go and try and limit my voice through my vote, that's when I get pissed. And that is what's happening here. That is exactly what's happening here. A law was introduced in Arizona where Biden also won to make it easier to challenge the results of an election by giving the state legislature in Arizona ways to simply reject the certified results. Just reject them. Just say, we get that the Secretary of State oversaw. We get that there was no fraud. We get that there were hand recounts. We get that they matched up completely 100% of the time. That the poll books actually added up to the same number of ballots that were collected. So we know no stuffing of any ballot box could have occurred because the polls, the, the poll books are the same number, right? So they understand that it's become so documented that you can't steal an election anymore so they simply gave themselves the right to reject a certified result in arizona i'm telling you you know if anybody who remembers reading about jim crow so that was suppression of black votes in the south and now we're all black Mary had a little man and the fall. We believe that all men are created equal. The magnificent mosaic that is America. From radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream. Change has come to America. Believe me. Help is on the way. Knock, knock. Who's there? Hey. It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Road Show. Turn up your mind. Today, Mitch McConnell made something explicitly clear. A GOP-controlled Senate would never again confirm a Democratic Supreme Court nominee. In other words, if they regain the majority, they plan to pack the court with conservative justices in perpetuity. The minority leader told radio host Hugh Hewitt that it was highly unlikely, if the next presidential campaign is underway, that he would bring a Biden nominee to the floor for a vote. I think in the middle of a presidential election, if you have a Senate of the opposite party of the president, you have to go back to the 1880s to find the last time a vacancy was filled. So I think it's highly unlikely. In fact, no, I don't think uh, either party, if it controlled, if it were different from the president, would confirm a Supreme Court nominee in the middle of of an election. what was different in 2020 was we were of the same party as the correct. president. Correct. So Mitch McConnell, uh, here, here, here's a rough guide, okay? Mitch McConnell will fill an empty seat on the Supreme Court if a Democrat is president and nominates them when pigs fly. When pigs fly. 
or when Donald Trump is reinstated, which also will be when pigs fly. I just, you know, I just hope that uh, Biden enjoys his meeting with Vladimir Putin because uh, spending time with Vladimir is probably more enjoyable than spending time with Mitch McConnell. I swear to God, this man is such an impediment to democracy and progress. He doesn't want to investigate an insurrection at the Capitol that he got on the Senate floor and said the president is responsible. The president and some other powerful allies, they lied to the American people and they caused this hatred and they caused this violence and I blame them, And but I don't want to investigate anything. I don't want to know. I don't want to get to the bottom of, uh, you know, why we have domestic terrorists in this country. I just want to, you know, I just want to move on. I just, I, I, I don't love the police. I was pretending to love the police. And so when you have 140 police officers that are tased and beaten and they have uh, their spinal cords uh, broken and they have, uh, you know, uh, uh, heart attacks right then and there or strokes as a result of chemicals sprayed on them or they're being crushed on camera and screaming for help. I don't, uh, I'm not that interested. I'm not that interested. You know, that's another thing he said. He's not going to uh, investigate the insurrection. No, doesn't want to. Late last week, the Democratic leader and the Democratic whip gave in to the urge to pick at the scab of politically motivated investigations that have become their party's favorite weapon against the previous administration. You know, Mitch, shut up. Also, he doesn't want to investigate the spying that occurred at the DOJ against Democratic enemies and the enemies of the people, the press the free and fair press. That's another thing he doesn't want to look into. He says it's a smear. It's a smear of Bill Barr. If we look into the DOJ spying on Eric Swalwell, spying on uh, uh, Adam Schiff, spying on Washington Post reporters, spying on New York Times reporters, spying on CNN. CNN sucks. I mean, this is so, he is so anti-democratic, this man. Because he makes money being an autocrat. He makes a lot of it. The donors love Mitch McConnell's hands-off attitude when it comes to their wrongdoing and this endless, endless investigatory route that they take whenever the Democrats are in charge. It's really sad. It's really sick. It's unbelievable how all that exists for Mitch McConnell is donor money and politics. And there is nothing in his wheelhouse that remotely resembles democracy or free speech or access or uh, Medicaid expansion, health care, infrastructure investment. Nothing, nothing at all should get done. Nothing at all should get done when you have a Democratic president. I mean, including filling a, an empty Supreme Court seat he, he said he wouldn't even have a hearing, never mind in the middle of an election year, 2024. And of course, you remember Amy COVID Barrett was confirmed during the height of the election. You remember that, right? You do. So we voted in November and she was confirmed in October. Yeah. Eight days after Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away, eight days later, we had her name. Mitch McConnell put her name Donald Trump had nominated her because Mitch McConnell told him to because that's what the Federalist Society told him to do. But he won't even have a hearing, he says, in 2023, a non-election year. It's too close. Now, he did all this to Merrick Garland, right? He did this to Merrick Garland when Obama nominated Merrick Garland a year out, a year before an election, a year, a year before. And he's just going back to the same playbook to do nothing for anybody that, uh, you know, votes in the majority. So I'm, I'm telling you, the idea that Republicans got from all of this is no matter what the American people vote for, no matter what the American people say they want, whether it's in a red state like Missouri and they say that they want Medicaid expansion, uh, whether it's. 7 million more people voting for Biden because they didn't like the Amy COVID Barrett uh, crap that they saw and it motivated them to get up and go out and vote or they voted because they didn't like Donald Trump, uh, you know, and the racism and they wanted that to come to a screeching halt. The lesson that the Republicans took 
from that was we, we need to fix elections better, and if people still overcome all of the suppression efforts that we put in, in place, we need to take unto ourselves the ability to ignore the will of the people. That's what Mitch McConnell is saying right there. He's saying that even though we all voted for a Democratic president, 7 million more of us and 74 more electoral votes went to Joe Biden than did Donald Trump, Joe Biden got 306 electoral votes. It doesn't matter to Mitch McConnell. He will do exactly what Missouri is doing to its voters. Ignore them. Ignore them. Refuse to fund it. Refuse to bring it up for a vote. Refuse to, uh, you know, uh, uh, even have a hearing. Refuse to debate. Refuse everything. Just use whatever political tools you have to undo the will of the American people. Listen, I got news for you, that is not a democracy. I don't know what it is at this point. It seems like an oligarchy to me where people are being, uh, oh, let's say, put into leadership positions based on their ability to raise corporate dollars. The only reason why Mitch McConnell is the leader is because Mitch McConnell raises more money than anybody else. Uh, So, I, I mean, we don't have anything that resembles a democracy now. We just don't. We either have, uh, you know, we came very close to autocracy. We came very close to being Russia, where, you know, there's fake elections in Russia, right? It, it, It seems like there's elections in Russia, but of course, you know, Putin just goes right ahead and arrests anybody that would run against him. And if he doesn't arrest them, then he poisons them or tries to have them killed. And then if they survive, he has them arrested and thrown in jail, right? So we came very close. I mean, in the second term of Donald Trump, you can best believe, you can best believe that the lock her up crowd would have bypassed the Department of Justice completely. And Donald Trump would have had his flying monkeys, his terrorists, go and arrest any opponent. And the people who follow him, the the, the people who don't give a rat's ass about American democracy or freedom or First Amendment rights, only second, uh, they, they would applaud that. They would applaud a country where the President of the United States bypasses grand juries, bypasses subpoenas, bypasses somebody, you know, to confront their accuser in a court of law and just locks people up. They, they would be for that. They are domestic terrorists. And we do have a freaking problem in this country. We do. All things Randy at RandyRhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. We're almost there. We're almost there. We're almost there. Stay on target. Stay on target. <laughs> it is the final few days of the summer free speech TV pledge drive. Yes, it is. So if you haven't donated yet, please do so today. Thank you very much. Just dial your phone, 877 877- Three seven eight eighty six sixty nine. That will put you in touch with somebody in Denver, Colorado, where Free Speech TV is based, and they will be able to tell you what you can have for your donation. For twenty dollars, you get something. For fifty dollars, you get something. For a hundred and fifty dollars, you get something. Okay, uh, and they'll be able to tell you exactly what those premiums are today. Eight seven seven three seven eight eighty six sixty nine. And of course, Sandy and Stewart in California are pledging $5,000 extra dollars if we reach our final pledge drive goal on Friday. So every $5 counts. Every $5, every $10, every dollar counts. If you want to do it online, feel free. Just go to freespeech.org. Freespeech.org. Thank you very much. All right, so... um, here, here, here is a conversation about those of us who are looking for a solution to the dilemma. What can we do? How worried are you that these efforts, as ludicrous as some of them are, will actually impede people's ability to vote? Well, I'm, I'm con- deeply concerned because it's worked before. We keep forgetting that voter suppression isn't new, and these are variations on a theme. I I talk about it in Our Time Is Now, that voter suppression began with the inception of this nation, 
But what has happened in the 21st century is that it's been digitized. It's been commoditized and it's been franchised out of the South and across the country. Mm -hmm. And what we are seeing with the fake audits, with the intimidation of election workers, with the criminalization of simply doing the job of managing democracy, we are seeing attacks on all levels of our democracy and we should be deeply concerned about it. But we should also remember that it's our democracy and we have the right to reassert ourselves and to push back. And that's why we are doing hot call summer and why we are reaching out to every single senator, calling on each of them to do their job and to pass the For the People Act. So there is a phone number that you can call that Stacey Abrams has put up uh, for hot call summer. Hot girl. Hot girl summer. Hot call summer is what she's calling it. Um, and, uh, you know, listen, the, the history of this country is one of having to overcome. It is. You know, when we first opened up voting in this country, it was only white male property owners. Why, you white male renters, you weren't even allowed to vote and had to fight for that. Then we had black property owners. Then we had blacks. Then we had women. And now we're back to we're all black. So there is a phone number. And what this phone number will do is it will put you into a switchboard and they will ask you who your senator is and they will connect you. And then you'll hang up and you'll call the other one because you have two senators no matter where you live. For hot call summer, we're asking everyone to call their U.S. senators, both of them, call them every day. The number is 888-453-3211, 888-453-3211. When you call that number, it's it's painless. We will connect you to your U.S. senator, both the first one, then you talk to that person, then you call back and do the second one. Simple, and you do it every day, every freaking day. We're going to be like mosquitoes. We're going to be like no seams. Just annoying. Just freaking annoying. That goes especially for West Virginians and Arizonans. Oh, yes. It is your turn to get active and to call your senators, both of them. So if you're in Arizona, you will call Mark Kelly and you will call Kristen Cinema's office. If you are in uh, West Virginia... You will call Miss Capito and you will call Joe Manchin. And on and on it goes. And you'll do it every damn stinking day. Every day. Until Joe Manchin and Kristen Cinema and others who may not love everything that's in HR1, because it will cut off the dark money, it will cut off their entire social life. What do I mean by that? Well, there are breakfast fundraisers that lobby shops have, and they're on behalf of corporate clients. That's how that works, right? Corporate clients go to a lobby shop, and they hire the, the, the firm. They hire, you know, uh, whatever the firm is. And then the lobbyist uh, is tasked with delivering for that corporate client, and the way the lobbyist ingratiates him or herself into the legislator's life is by holding fundraisers for that legislator. Also getaways, little weekend jaunts to Martha's Vineyard or to the Caribbean or to, you know, the mountains in the summer and in the winter to the ski resorts. Oh yeah, that's what exactly goes on. And so there are gonna be plenty of Democratic senators that aren't completely thrilled with having their campaigns publicly financed instead of their social life as they know it, which is get up for breakfast and go to Charlie Palmer's and, uh, you know, listen to the lobbyist for fossil fuels. And then, you know, at lunchtime, go to, uh, you know, what used to be called Signatures, which was Jack Abramoff's deli. Okay, yeah, the lobbyist actually owned the restaurant. He figured out how to make money coming and going. Also ended up in jail, but yeah. Okay, and then there's a cocktail party fundraiser, and then there's a dinner fundraiser, and then there are the weekend fundraisers, and then there are the vacation fundraisers, right? They may not be thrilled to find out that they won't have the ability to raise all this money. 
So everyone needs to do it. Everyone needs to call 888-888-453-3211. 453-3211. Deborah in San Francisco. Hi, how are you doing today? Hey. First time caller. Ooh. <laughs> anyway, I listen to you day in and day out. Besides voting and donating, what else can we do about this injustice? Okay, so I, I just gave a phone number. I really want you to call it. It's 888-453-3211. Thir- okay. And you're going to talk to Diane Feinstein, and you're going to uh, actually leave a message for her office or talk to somebody in her office, and you're going to tell her that this filibuster has to go when it comes to voting rights. Okay. And you're going to do that every day. Mm-hmm. Every day. Okay. And you're going to be like a like a pesty little mosquito. <laughs> a thorn in her side. Yes. Yes. Except okay. more annoying than a thorn. Okay. Just more <laughs> annoying. Like a little no see Do you have those in San Francisco? <laughs> yes. They're so annoying. So that's your job. You're going to be a no see Okay. All right. Thanks, Randy. Thank, Thank you, you for your team and all that you do for us. Yeah, oh, vice versa. Thanks for listening. Appreciate you. Bye-bye. Bye. 453 3211. 888 453 3211. Call in and connect. To speak to Randy, call 561 270 3844. 561 270 3844. I think spying did occur. Late last week, the Democratic leader and the Democratic whip gave in to the urge to pick at the scab of politically motivated investigations that have become their party's favorite weapon against the previous administration. They indicated that they were prepared to compel two former attorneys general to testify before the Judiciary Committee on efforts to trace leaks of sensitive national security information. In case anyone had forgotten, our colleagues are among the same Democrats who spent years demanding repeated investigations of a Republican president while turning a blind eye to the clear abuses of power (laughs) that infected the investigation of his campaign. So any outrage from Democrats that alleged criminal leaks within their own ranks rightly drew the attention of federal investigators rings completely hollow. You're an oozy pussy scab. You're a gravy sore on democracy. Uh, You don't want to investigate spying that went on at the behest of Donald Trump inside the DOJ against enemies of the president, including the press, CNN and the Washington Post and the New York Times and uh, his congressional investigators, Swalwell and, and, and... I mean, th- th- this man is so phony. How how many investigations do we have into Benghazi? How long did that go on? And Hillary Clinton's emails. Now there's emails showing that the president of the United States tried to use the Department of Justice not just to spy on his perceived political enemies, but also to nullify the results of a free and fair election because he lost. God, Mitch, you are you 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 are so in league with Vlad. The idea that you are destroying democracy in front of everybody's face is breathtaking. It's just, I mean, it's unbelievably breathtaking. And and you know, uh, Michael Schmidt from the New York Times, who was one of those that were, they all know what happened. If this was a mistake, then you think that that the Justice Department would have reached out to McGahn to say, hey, look, you know, we were looking at something else. Your stuff got soaked up in this thing. You're obviously a very important person that was in the government at the time. You were the Justice Department's chief witness against the president Ah. and an existential threat to the presidency, to Donald Trump's presidency at the time. Um, We just wanted to give you a heads up on this. Instead, the McGahn's learning of this through notification from their their providers or from Apple or such. So so um, you would think that someone this may have come across someone's desk earlier if it was something that was inadvertent. Right. Um, in terms of perception, one of the unfortunate things here is that here we are a few weeks into this story. We know that that the Justice Department um, subpoenaed or tried to subpoena records um, from five from five sort of different entities. Uh, 
one one bucket of those people was the enemy, the enemy of the people. Donald Trump's you know biggest enemies, the New York Times, the Washington Post and CNN. OK, so those were the first three. The next one we know about is Adam Schiff, the president's chief uh, critic on Capitol Hill, who was leading the investigation into Russia's meddling in the election. The next one is Don McGahn, the chief witness against the president in the Mueller investigation. Look, my guess is there's other subpoenas out there and such, but the five that we know about fit very neatly into the category of the president's greatest enemies. And these are not enemies that Donald Trump talked about behind closed doors. These are enemies that Donald Trump tweeted about, that Donald Trump talked about in public interviews, in public statements on the South Lawn of the White House and in private to to his aides. That is Michael Schmidt. He is a reporter, a a damn good one, uh, the Washington reporter for the New York Times. Isn't it interesting that uh, the president only spied on people who were witnesses against him, a la his own White House counsel, Don McGahn, uh, and other reporters who were also putting out information about Donald Trump's fraud and Donald Trump's reliance on Russia's interference and the and then the two House impeachment guys, Swalwell and Schiff, and that there was no leaking. They never found any leaking. And the only way that Don McGahn and anybody that Donald Trump used the Department of Justice to spy on uh, found out was through the provider, through Apple. Because they had put gag orders on Apple as well. Listen, here, here's, a, here's a handy little solution for that problem. No secret subpoenas. You know, I've been anti-FISA court since the inception of the FISA court. America is not a place where justice should ever be done in secret. Okay, you don't go and get warrants on people in secret and you don't have subpoenas with gag orders attached to them so that you can investigate your political enemies. And then on the back end, when the inspector general for the Department of Justice, who is a guy whose name, you know, it's Michael Horowitz. It's still Michael Horowitz. Okay, and so when the inspector general is now tasked with going and finding out what the hell happened, uh, how is DOJ spying on reporters and the White House counsel, who was a chief witness against Donald Trump, and two House Democrats who were the chief prosecutors in the impeachments of Donald Trump. How in the hell did that happen? Just know this. Michael Horowitz, the inspector general, does not have the ability to subpoena Bill Barr or Jeff Sessions or Rod Rosenstein, or any ex-DOJ employee. The Inspector General is only allowed to speak to actively serving Department of Justice officials. He's not allowed to speak to ex-anything. And so Bill Barr knows this. See, Bill Barr is the cover-up king, okay? He did it in Iran-Contra, for God's sake. And he's back to do the cover-up for Donald Trump and do the spying for Donald Trump. And then cover- See, and, and Bill Barr knows that Horowitz can't call him. He knows Horowitz can't call Sessions. He knows Horowitz can't call anybody that isn't currently employed at the Department of Justice. So he believes he got away with it. That's why, that's why they requested, the uh, Senate Republicans did, and the House Republicans, requ- uh, Democrats, sorry, requested that Barr come and testify. Now, they can issue a congressional subpoena. But the IG, the inspector general, he can't subpoena Bill Barr. He can't subpoena anybody that was part of the Trump administration that isn't there. This is why yesterday you saw the national security director at the Department of Justice, John Demers or Demers, suddenly resigned He suddenly resigned. Now, you know what's interesting about him? Barr says he has no recollection of issuing subpoenas. Sessions, I don't know what he says, you know, but uh, Rod Rosenstein, who would have been in charge of that because Sessions had recused himself, remember. So 
Rod would have been the deputy who would have issued the initial subpoena. Now, Barr just renewed them three times. But they both say, Rosenstein and Barr, they have no recollection of uh, doing that. But John Demers suddenly resigns. That keeps him out of the reach. This is the Randy Rhodes Show. To speak with Randy, dial 561-270-3844. That's 561-270-3844. His name is John Demers, Morgan, and Justice Department officials say that this departure was long planned. Uh -huh. He had been asked to stay on. He, he, was a, he ran the National Security Division during the Trump administration. He's a Trump appointee, and Obama officials had asked him to stay on uh, until the summer. But uh, it, it doesn't appear to be an accident that this news emerged today amid this imbroglio over the question of the Justice Department secretly seizing the phone records of members of Congress and the news media, because in this job as the head of the National Security Division, John Demers would have been at least briefed on this. Whether he was in the decision chain, we do not know. Um, but he was one of the career officials who would have known about it because it's right within his purview. And there's a lot of questions about exactly how this got authorized. Recall that um, uh, people close to attorney, former Attorney General Jeff Sessions, Bill Barr, and Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein have all said that they don't recall authorizing subpoenas for the records of members of Congress. So one of the complicating factors of his departure is that um, there is an inspector general investigation into this whole matter, but the inspector general doesn't have the right generally to to demand the testimony of former employees. So the fact that he's leaving the department puts him out of the reach potentially, unless he volunteers to talk, of this IG investigation, but it doesn't put him out of the reach of a congressional hmm. subpoena. See, 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 see what I'm telling you? See what I'm telling you? It puts him out of reach of Michael Horowitz, the inspector general at the Department of Justice. It's just so fascinating how he just suddenly resigns, uh, knowing that that puts him out of the reach of Michael Horowitz, the inspector general, on Spygate, okay, uh, which only captured Trump's perceived political and legal enemies, his own White House counsel, Don McGahn, and his wife, the children of Eric Swalwell and Adam Schiff. New York Times reporters, plural. Washington Post reporters, plural. And CNN, Barbara Starr at the Pentagon. So fascinating that all those people were identified by Donald Trump in various tweets, in various speeches, in various rallies as being the enemy of the people. And those are the ones that were spied upon. And the last remaining Trump appointee in the Department of Justice, Mr. Demers, suddenly resigns yesterday, putting him out of reach. Now, if Barr doesn't remember, uh, you know, renewing subpoenas, and if Jeff Sessions doesn't remember issuing subpoenas, and if Rod doesn't remember issuing subpoenas, what was Mr. Demers doing? See what I mean? They, they, they aren't stupid people, okay? They know that it puts them out of reach of any IG investigation into Spygate. They know it. Do you think they'll volunteer? Because it took Congress two years to get Don McGahn to sit down. And remember, Don McGahn not only fought in court to the point where when he finally went to, the Cap uh, to Capitol Hill to testify last week, no one cared. No one cared. But he also managed to put fences around what he could be asked about. So they couldn't ask him about Spygate. They couldn't ask him anything. They couldn't ask him anything except for the firing of Bob Mueller. What did Donald Trump ask you to do? Did he, at long last, ask you to fire Bob Mueller? And the answer was yes. And did he then ask you to falsify a letter for the record saying that you were never asked to fire Bob Mueller? Answer, yes. And that's it. That's what we got after two years. And now we find out Don McGahn was uh, targeted because Don McGahn did talk to Mueller. 
Bill Barr is the cover-up king. The cover-up king. He literally covered up the entire Iran-Contra operation. I mean, literally kept you know kept people out of jail. Literally got people pardoned for selling tow missiles. Yeah, to Iran on the sly. How do you sell a tow missile on the sly? Well, Ronald Reagan figured it out. Selling tow missiles to Iran on the sly, probably to get hostages released at the beginning of his presidency, even before he was sworn in, and then taking the money, laundering it through Saudi Arabia and buying drugs with it, putting it into the streets of California, the crack epidemic, and, uh, you know, uh, Washington Heights in New York, taking the money from the sale of the drugs and financing a secret war in Central America that we're still paying for with mass migration because we corrupted their democratic governance. Bill Barr. Brian in Florida. Hi, Randy. How are you? All right. I have a quick question for you. First of all, let me say that I am going to call our senators. I'm here in Florida also. Okay. Uh, but let me preface by saying, just like Joe Manchin in West Virginia, who doesn't listen to the people, why would they change their mind if I call? I'm, I'm, because I'm you're going to annoy for- them. First of all, let me tell you, the thing that they're most afraid of, as you can see, is the people showing up. It is what they fear the most. When the people show up, it freaks them out. This is why they're so big on voter suppression. Anything they can do to keep you from having your say, they will do. So calling them, when their phones light up in their offices, it freaks Mm -hmm. them out. Know why? They think they might lose if they go against all Even if it's the calls. same person calling every day? Every day. Cool. I'll do it. Every day. Every day. And it won't just be you. It'll be... No, no, no. I realize that. But don't they keep a like a list of the people yeah. that call? Yes, they do. But they and also like, oh, know Brian that the people that call again. are the people who vote. And typically the people who call are the people who vote in primaries. And we do. Yeah. And so you need to make yourself, uh, you know, uh, you need to make yourself annoying because the one thing that they don't like is when people are paying attention and do something, anything, making a phone call, sending a postcard, sending an email. They don't like it. As my husband would say, I am annoying. Well, there you go. and Put it to good use. You know, (laughs) take your natural predisposition and make it work for you. Make it sing. Sounds good. I will do that. All right. But that was going through the back of my head. It's like, like Manson. Listen, the, listen o- the well, the only anyway. thing, the only thing they're afraid of is losing. That's the only thing yeah. that they're afraid of is losing. Now, Mitch McConnell obviously hates Donald Trump because he's now the minority leader. Sure, he didn't lose, but he's the minority leader. And the more Senate seats that go, uh, you know, to to the Democratic Party, especially here in Florida, you're calling two two Republicans who aren't going to sound like they give much of a crap. But trust me, that freaks them out. I will trust you. I've trusted you in the past. So I'll trust you now. I'm telling you, it's it it works like a charm. When there aren't any phone calls, they just assume you don't know anything about this, that you don't know about the voter suppression efforts. And if you did, you didn't care that you're about them, that you're with their program, which is to let people just, you know, uh, go to the Capitol and try and overthrow an election and have no investigation whatsoever. And then on the back end of that kind of violence, say, you know what? The only reason why that was a bad idea wasn't because of the violence. No, the only reason that was a bad idea is because they tried to fix it after the election. We need to fix it before the election. And that is what this is about. This is about getting them to say, we need the For the People Act. We have to get voting rights, uh, you know, because people will vote in a primary and people will vote in the general. And not only will we lose our seats, but we'll be stuck in a minority. 
Now, that, that's the second thing. The first thing is losing an election. That's the biggest fear. The second thing is being in the minority party where you have absolutely no ability to pass anything. Therefore, the lobbyists don't consider you a valuable player. And therefore, you get less fundraisers. You get less breakfast at Charlie Palmer's. You get less code, you know, uh, uh, little uh, congressional trips. That's why they don't want to be in the minority. It makes them less valuable players, right? And you don't, uh, you don't draft them. You don't go out there and spend your money on them. You go and you spend your money on Chris Coons. Really? The Democrat from Delaware? Yes, yes, because he can affect change. He can shove something into an omnibus package. You can't. You can't. So just remember, when you show up, they get scared. Mary had a little man, man, man. The fault. We believe that all men are created equal. equal. To the magnificent mosaic that is America. From radio beacon to radio beacon. Change has come to America. Believe me. Help is on the way. Knock, knock. Who's there? Hey! It's a segment of your imagination. Randy Road Show. Turn up your mind. Today is the day American patriots start taking down names and kicking ass. The whole world is watching, folks. If you just roll over, if you don't fight. Fight for Trump. Fight for Trump. Let's have trial by combat. You don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Remember that, everybody? Remember that? I thought I would jog your memory about uh, this peaceful protest where they stayed within the cordons, right? Because it's going to come up again today on this show. But first, I want to wish you all a happy Juneteenth, almost. Almost. Joe Biden is going to sign a piece of legislation today making Juneteenth the day that uh, Major General Gordon Granger went to Texas and told Texas, about a quarter of a million Texas black folks, that they were free two years after the Emancipation Proclamation, two years after the end of the Civil War. It took two years to get to Texas. Like your electricity, like that. (laughs) Texas, I don't know what your deal is. I I really don't. I mean, you want to be your own country so damn bad. You really do. Uh, Your grid is not connected to the national grid, so uh, there's nothing I can do to help you. There's nothing I can do. But your brilliant governor... Okay, your brilliant, brilliant governor has a grid that doesn't work when it's too cold four months ago. Now it's too hot four months later because it only works at room temperature or something like that. I don't know. So that's uh, it took two years for Texas to get the information about the Emancipation Proclamation. And Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee from Houston who has been a friend of this show for probably 20 years, okay, I've known her that long, uh, had sponsored the first federal holiday in, in like, I don't know, since what, uh, Martin Luther King Day? Since then. And it finally got passed in the Senate unanimously yesterday. That's crazy, but it did. And then it passed the House by 414 to 14. Don't even ask. There are 14 people that just don't believe in celebrating the Emancipation Proclamation. I don't know. And they're Republicans. And this was Lincoln's, uh, you know, own document. So it's uh, very interesting that they're not for Lincoln when, uh, you know, they're not for Lincoln. But they're for Lincoln when they're for him. I don't know what that means. So anyway, um, today is the last work day before the big Juneteenth holiday, which will be June 19th, which falls on a Saturday. So I was going to ask you what your plans were, considering we have less than a day to plan it. (laughs) This is like, wow, 
So um, next year, next year, everybody, next year in Jerusalem, I don't know. Next year, Juneteenth, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll all be able to celebrate, I suppose, I guess. Uh, somebody give me a 2022 calendar. Tell me what day it falls on. Because we get ripped off of holidays uh, this particular year. I mean, July 4th is what, a Saturday or Sunday? Yeah, I'm going to make that into a four-day weekend. You just watch me do that. I am going to do that. <laughs> Because Brett needs to see his damn family, and so do I. And now we can go. Now we can travel. Now we can do. Now we can be. So uh, I'm going to New York, and Brett is going. Uh, where are you going? Syracuse, upstate. Oh, Syracuse. Yeah, Very yeah, nice. yeah upstate. Okay. I, I never know if you're fam. going to Savannah or Syracuse. No more Savannah. No more Savannah. And I know Juan listens every now and then. Juan, you're the next on the list. One of my best friends that live in the area. He has been badgering me for just over 25 years to visit him in, uh, in uh, Austin, Texas. So one of these vacations, I got to go there. But uh, this oh, one's for my- Oh, you'll love it. Have uh, you ever I can't been? Wait. I had one time, uh, a couple days, it was as progressive and awesome and vibrant and the food and the everything. I enjoyed myself very much in Austin. But uh, this, this trip's going to be for Syracuse, for my parents. Well, just make sure you don't go to Austin when they're having mass shootings, because that's bad. <laughs> Got it. Right. And after September, uh, you know, Texas, every idiot's going to be able to have a gun. Uh, he signed it. Abbott did. You know, I, I like I said, I, I, two years to get news to Texas that uh, African-Americans are actually free people. Uh, it just And, and then uh, electricity gets there about the same rate. And they charge you more for it there. <laughs> and now you have shootings in liberal Austin. Okay, great. So uh, we got some Supreme Court decisions today is what we got. Uh, they're out with a bunch, a whole bunch. There was some yesterday about crack cocaine and the First Step Act and how it doesn't apply to this kid who apparently was charged as a career criminal. This kid uh, was charged as a career criminal for like uh, two other things that he did when he was like 14 that he got less than four months for. It's just a mess of a case. But Clarence Thomas wrote it, everybody. Clarence Thomas wrote it. Uh, it's so interesting how Tim Scott, the only black Republican, is supposed to do the police reform stuff, which is falling apart as we speak. And Clarence Thomas, the only black Supreme Court justice, is going to write the crack cocaine ruling. I just, you know, just draw your own conclusions. I will be over here celebrating Juneteenth. But now not only is Congress full of crazy people who have the power to uh, declare war once again, because, you know, uh, another thing today, they're overwhelmingly uh, going to vote in Congress to take back the 2002 war authorization. That has been, we had, we had a, a seriously, manifestly insane president. You didn't know what he was going to do on any given day of the week. And now we have Joe Biden and Congress decides to take away the authorization uh, to, you know, commit us to war from the executive branch. Wow. So, OK, so I'm celebrating the fact that, uh, you know, we have somehow taken back, uh, you know, the right to declare war and given it to the people's house. I, I don't but so so we know Congress is full of crazy people, and now they have the power to declare war, which sort of unnerves me. And the Supreme Court just issued a couple of uh, decisions that everybody ought to know about. And the good news is we still have health care. That's the good news. The ACA was allowed to stand yet again. I mean, they have tried to destroy the ACA by legislation 71 times, the Republicans have. 71 times they wanted to take away my health care coverage, mine, because I have Obamacare, okay? I am self-employed, and I have Obamacare. And they wanted to take it away from me uh, 71 times, the Republicans did. And you remember John McCain, uh, you know, uh, famously went out there and gave it a thumbs down and saved it the last time. Remember that? Remember that, everybody? Okay. Uh, and so they went to the Supreme Court again. Third time, maybe third time's a charm. Now, Supreme Court said, eh, there's nothing wrong with the ACA. Okay? It's a valid law, and it can stand. So celebrate the fact that we had three crazy people put on the Supreme Court by a crazy president, and we still have health care. That's the good news. The bad news is that there was this religious freedom um, issue let's just call it now i don't know how how to tell tell it to you except to tell it to you in a truthful way the truthful way is that it was the city of philadelphia who contracted with catholic services okay to place children in foster care and because catholic services contracted with the city of philadelphia 
they were um, charged with complying with the anti-discrimination laws that uh, applied to the contract. But because the city was very careless in its enforcement of anti-discrimination laws, hmm, and because the city actually gave exceptions to certain contractors along the way, the Supreme Court ruled that Catholic Charities doesn't have to comply with the anti-discrimination contract clause because it's not routinely enforced and it's also, uh, they've been giving exceptions to various uh, you know, contractors on different parts of the contract. And so the right wing is going to declare victory on the basis of a ruling about religious liberty. But this was really a contract case. I'll explain it better or more if you need it. All things Randy at RandyRhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. I want to do this early today, early today, because we have uh, a surprise match day for the next to last day for the summer pledge drive for free speech TV. Any donation made today will be doubled doubled up to $5,000 thanks to the free speech TV frontline funders Bob and Carol in Oregon. But it's really a triple impact day because we're still running towards this goal for the whole week. And if we get to the goal for the whole week, which a double donation would do for us, help us get to that goal, then remember Sandy and Stewart in California will also add $5,000. So today is a triple impact day. Great, great day to give $10, which actually could become $30, and $30 could become $90, you know what I mean? This is a very, very, very important day for Free Speech TV for our summer pledge drive. Now, tomorrow will be the last day. I don't know what they have in store for a surprise tomorrow, but this is really, really a good one. I I love the triple impact thing. I really do. So help us get to our final summer pledge drive number, and we'll get the $5,000 extra from Sandy and Stewart in California. And today, to get us to that number, Anything you do will be doubled by uh, Bob and Carol, Ted and Alice, in Oregon. Just kidding. I'm sure that they've heard that joke about a zillion times, okay? So uh, just dial the number 877-378-8669. That's the number, 877-378-8669. Or make your donation at freespeech.org. And thank you. Thank you very, very much. We're almost done. We're almost done. Okay. So let me explain uh, what really happened in this religious freedom case. This was, it turned into a contract dispute, is what it did. Now, people are gonna remember the Masterpiece Cake case as well, which was sold to us as a baker in Colorado who won on religious liberty grounds And that also turned out to be nothing more than he was treated badly uh, by the city council. So the Supreme Court ruled that he was treated badly by the city council. They narrowed uh, the scope of the actual case down to was he treated fairly or hostily by the city council. And they said that the masterpiece cake baker was treated hostily by the city council. And that's all they ruled on, was whether or not he was treated well by the council. And uh, they said, no, he was not. Now, people uh, have been selling that idea to right-wing audiences ever since as you have the right to discriminate against people who come into your store. Well, in the mask situation, you could see how that reared its ugly little head and did not fly. It did not fly. If you are in private business, uh, you you could require somebody no sho- no shoes, no shirt, no service, no mask, no service, right? So it basically, this case is also narrowed. It was very, very narrowed so that the freaks on the Supreme Court could avoid the whole issue of religious liberty being a right to discriminate. So what they did instead was they said, look, you know, uh, we're just going to look at uh, Catholic Charities claim that the city 
of Philadelphia allowed for exceptions to the uh, uh, the contract rules for various other contractors. Therefore, they should you know make an exception for the Catholic charities, you know, anti-discrimination clause, uh, and you know they they should be excused from having to comply because it's not enforced all the time. And that's what they narrowed the issue down to. I will tell you that the true interpretation of the Constitution, the only interpretation of the Constitution that is permissible in our democracy is that the constitutional right to religious freedom, meaning the sanctity of your own personal beliefs um, are protected, extends only as far as your nose. Now, I have said this about the mass mandates too, okay? Because when they were in force, that's where your rights begin and end. Uh, your rights begin and end where your nose begins and ends, right? Same thing with religious, uh, you know, uh, beliefs. Your right to believe whatever you want, of course, is an inalienable right. It can't be taken away from you. But when you use your religious beliefs to harm another or violate the law, that can't fly and doesn't fly in this country. And so that's kind of where your freedom ends with the exercise of your faith when it becomes an issue of will it harm another person? And everybody that sits on the Supreme Court uh, kind of knows that. And anybody that knows the Constitution or is a constitutional scholar or writes about the Constitution or reads the Constitution or takes the time to learn about the Constitution, they know that. They know that. And that's why these cases are such bull crap. But I will tell you that they could have, you know, this was a unanimous decision. And so if you can't remember everything I just said, just say, well, Sotomayor thinks it's okay, so it must be okay. And, you know, soothe yourself with that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what else to tell you. But the true issue was whether or not this was a badly written contract in the first place, whether or not other contractors had been excused, and whether or not it's enforced equally across all contractors. And the answer to those three questions was yes, no, and no. And so that's what they ruled on. Now, the real issue that, that should have been dealt with is whether or not Catholic Services has the right to not place foster children in their care with same-sex loving parents who want to foster children. I will tell you that no gay couple in Philadelphia ever applied to Catholic uh, Services to foster any of the children that are in Catholic Services care. It never happened. There are, I think, 30 or 20 other agencies in Philadelphia that also place children in foster homes. And uh, that's where same-sex couples typically go if they're willing to foster some, uh, somebody's uh, child. And uh, they are given children to provide loving homes to through those other agencies. So that that is it, that that's the way it's supposed to look. Now, if 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 I were on the Supreme Court, I'm just saying, you know, I'm wearing black today. It just, you know, I need a doily, but if I were on the Supreme Court, I would have said exactly what the 3rd Circuit Court of Appeals said. The the 3rd Circuit Court of Appeals didn't side with Catholic Charities at all, not even on the contract issue. The Third Circuit Court in Philadelphia ruled against Catholic uh, services, saying that the city is entitled to demand compliance with its non-discrimination policies when you contract with the city. And that's what I would have written down, and that would have been my dissent. But instead, the court was able to have a unanimous decision because it only ruled on whether or not the city allowed exceptions to other contractors. And since the city allowed other contractors to exempt themselves from various clauses, they said, okay, you have to do it in this case too. That's it. Call in, connect. To speak to Randy, call 561-270-3844. 561-270-3844. An actor 
because of January 6th, our attorney general told us this week, we've got to change our country forever. And yet, given all the talking, the endless talking about January 6th, it is remarkable what we still don't know about what actually took place that day. Then have a commission. Until this Monday night, for example, when it was reported by Revolver News, we had Revolver no idea News? that at least 20 organizers and participants in the events at the Capitol have not been indicted, despite the nationwide dragnet for people who were there. Revolver News. This is interesting. The government knows exactly who these people are. They do. But has refused to charge them with crimes. Why is that? Well, because it seems like they may have had some connection to the government. Some of the people who broke into the Capitol, committed crimes while inside, and encouraged others to do the same appear to have been in contact with the FBI before the event. Let that sink in for a moment. Okay. The events of January 6th that you keep hearing about endlessly, events that Democrats in Congress describe as an act of war carried out by white supremacists, as dangerous and historically significant as Pearl Harbor and 9-11, those events apparently were at least in part organized and carried out in secret by people connected to federal law enforcement. What? Wait, what? Okay, the man whose defense to defamation and lying is no reasonable person would believe a damn thing I say has just said for two nights in a row, I was going to ignore the first night, but he's now doubled down that the insurrection at the Capitol was a false flag operation. That it was conducted by our own government. What the actual... And the people who watch that channel and other channels like it don't know anything about the violence that happened at the Capitol. They don't. You know what they know? They know what Andy Clyde tells them, the representative from Georgia. There was no insurrection, and to call it an insurrection, in my opinion, is a bold-faced lie. Watching the TV footage of those who entered the Capitol and walked through Statuary Hall showed people in an orderly fashion staying between the stanchions and ropes taking videos and pictures. You know, if you didn't know the TV footage was a video from January the 6th, uh -huh. you would actually think it was a normal tourist visit. This is a normal tourist visit. A normal tourist. Yeah, thing. I visited uh, Grand Canyon with my folks. Uh, it was just like that, Randy. It was just like that. <laughs> yeah, if you take the helicopter ride and it starts crashing. I mean, this is so unbelievable. So Tucker Carlson is literally lying to his audience, hiding all these videos from them, telling them that the rally at the Capitol the night before, which I opened the show with, where Junior and 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 Hawley, Josh Hawley, whose whose book publisher dropped him because he he was like this, you know, go ahead, attack our own capital, go ahead, you know, uh, attack your own government, people, do it for Trump, do it for your your God, right? Uh, the the Rudy Giuliani trial by combat, uh, you know, all the speeches by uh, you know Gosar and 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 and, and crazy uh, uh, you know, congressman, you know. Uh, that that didn't happen either. None of it happened if you watch Fox News. What happened was a normal tourist visit. And any and now, okay, I, I don't even know how this audience like shifts in their mind this way. Because at first it was Antifa dressed up as three percenters and Proud Boys and Oath Keepers and other various white supremacist militias and misogynist groups and right it was Antifa that was their first try at rewriting history and this is what they pumped out on these uh, crazy you know news channels <laughs> news that actually uses as their defense for lying to their audience that no reasonable person will believe them okay this was after Sidney Powell got sued and her defense to lying about Dominion also the same no reasonable person would believe that dominion flip votes or anything i said about dominion they wouldn't believe that hugo chavez who's been dead for 13 years had anything to do with rigging an election in the united states in 2020 right it's just it's so okay so first it was antifa dressed up 
then it became just a normal tourist day and everybody was just you know um staying and taking pictures and everybody was like uh seriously well behaved and you know ron johnson said the same damn thing remember ron johnson was no one was we've armed. seen plenty of video of people in the capitol and, and they weren't riding it, they don't it doesn't look like an armed insurrection when you have people that breach the capitol and i don't condone it but they're staying within the rope lines in the rotunda that's not what an armed insurrection would look like. Okay. Okay, you get it, right? You get what I'm saying? So why do you watch that? That's the question. Why do you watch that? Because what? Because what? You like being misinformed or disinformed or you like being, uh, you know, like uh, the dumbest guy in the room. You like the white supremacist, uh, you know, talking points. What is it? He is saying that January 6th was an inside job. It was an FBI plot, a false flag to see if anybody will uh, Hitler salute it. This is crazy. This is mass madness. So, you know, you know, a bunch of patriotic ter- uh, tourists visiting the Capitol or Antifa forces disguised in MAGA outfits. They don't even live in a fantasy world anymore. It's like a mutually exclusive fantasy world. They can't even agree on what the fantasy is. And uh, so this is what uh, he said after he got called out by many, many mainstream reporters who said, what the F are you doing over there, right? Uh, Twitter actually is uh, taking down his tweets, okay, or fact-checking his tweets in real time because of the amount of propaganda that gets spewed out of him and Hannity's mouth, right? Well, last night, clips from our show began to circulate on social media. The tech monopolies, which helped get Joe Biden elected, oh, continued to work closely with the administration to control the news and information that you are allowed to see. Because it's America, oh, right? God. Well, this piece of news, the one on our show last night, was a problem for them, so they tried to make it go away. Twitter appended the following note to our clip last night, quote, Federal law does not permit cooperating witnesses or informants to be charged with conspiracy, despite a baseless suggestion by Tucker Carlson that some co-conspirators of the January 6th attack were not charged because they were undercover FBI agents, end quote. Hmm. Let's think about this. Now, leave aside for a second the most obvious question that arises from the statement, which is, how would Twitter which is a media company, not as far as we know, a law enforcement agency, be able to confirm our reporting last night was, quote, baseless. How would they know that? Because they read federal law. Okay, here's the law. If you are an FBI undercover agent, you can't be charged as a co-conspirator because you were just pretending. You get that? You get that? And Twitter understands federal law because they have lawyers. That's how they know what you said was baseless. They know federal law. Wow, this is really, really disorienting, isn't it? This is the Randy Rhodes Show. To speak with Randy, dial 561-270-3844. That's 561-270-3844. Look at the document. The government calls those people unindicted co-conspirators. What does that mean? Well, it means that in potentially every single case, they were FBI operatives. What? Really? Really, no. And this is the point of putting out homework, okay, as you just saw. This is the point of this show, is to debunk all of this garbage that's passing for information or news or accurate, uh, you know, uh, uh, descriptions of, of things that actually occurred in this country that are dangerous to democracy or dangerous to our existence, dangerous to our ability to vote, dangerous to our ability to live, dangerous to our ability to get a loan or to own a home or, I mean, uh, make a minimum wage. You know what I'm saying? So this is so bizarre. Here is what federal law actually says. You can, If you are an FBI undercover agent you cannot be identified in a document an indictment which is what he's talking about as a co-conspirator 
And he's pointing to indictments where there are co unind uh, unindicted co-conspirators, you know, that are identified by uh, uh, this indictment of various people. And he's then connecting a dot that won't connect to federal law to his audience saying that means that they're FBI informants. No, that means that they're not FBI informants. That is 100% not possible. Not possible. And so therefore his entire false flag operation theory is nothing but an another empty conspiracy theory. Just like they all stayed in between the rope lines, everybody was well behaved in Statuary Hall, just like they were Antifa dressed up as three percenters, dressed up as uh, Proud Boys, dressed up as uh, uh, Oath Keeper. I mean, all of these lies to cover up for an attempt to overthrow the government in a violent fashion on January 6th to preserve an insane president's presidency that was literally acted on in a violent, unbelievable way that caused the, the wounding of 140 police officers and five people ended up dead. All to excuse that, he will sit there and lie like this. And then he, he, he literally told his audience, we may never know the truth here. Are you freaking kidding me? There are videos that, I mean, Sunday, there's going to be an entire, uh, you know, uh, special on TV about the insurrection, okay, at 9 o'clock on CNN, uh, to explain to people what the hell went on there, how it was organized. And they don't want to have a commission because, obviously, people who were at that rally, people who financed it, people who encouraged it, people who were for it, people who literally are cowards about letting you know that they were for it, will end up being indicted too. Now, if, if we may never know the truth, wouldn't that be the clarion call for an independent 9-11 type commission to do the investigation, to figure out who financed it and who paid for those buses and how did those people get there and whether or not Trump was, uh, you know, uh, encouraging it and Gosar was part of it and Rudy was part. I mean, you know, it just, but, but no, they would rather say it's a deep state plot like Vladimir Putin told them to say. I mean, that was what Vladimir Putin said on that stage yesterday. He said that th this whole thing was, you know, uh, American uh, anti-democratic forces that were just trying to petition their government for a political grievance, as if there was no violence committed there, as if these videos were, were, were somehow faked. I, I just, I, they, they literally on Fox News first said it was an Antifa thing, and then they said it was a protest that got out of hand, and now they're saying it's a deep state plot. I, I just, I mean, this is so amazing. It's so sick. So anyway, here, here, here is Ellie Honig. Uh, obviously, he's an ex-prosecutor for the feds, and he knows the federal law telling Tucker it. Carlson uses this phrase, unindicted co-conspirator. And what he's trying to tell his audience is, gee, that must mean these people were working for the FBI, undercover agents or informants. He's got it wrong. Here's why. So the phrase unindicted co-conspirator is not something you can apply to someone working for the FBI because a conspiracy is a meeting of the minds. It's an agreement between two people to commit a crime. However, if you're an FBI undercover, if you're an informant, you're not really part of a criminal agreement. You're pretending for the sake of the investigation. <sighs> so no prosecutor would ever use this phrase, unindicted co-conspirator, to refer to somebody working for the FBI. We do use this phrase all the time to refer to other things, to refer to people who are still being investigated, who right. might be charged to refer to people who have been arrested and then cooperated later, different thing from what Carlson's talking about, or to refer to people who we don't know exactly who they are yet. So Tucker Carlson, all due respect to him, I've written a few more indictments than he has. He's got that dead wrong. Oh, so an unindicted co-conspirator could be somebody that's whose name is not known to law enforcement yet. An unindicted co-conspirator could be somebody who is getting leniency from the government for cooperating with the government. Oh, I see. An unindicted co-conspirator could be many things, but it can't be 
an FBI informant. It can't be somebody who was pretending to infiltrate these racist groups. Holy crap. This is, this is so, so bizarre. But I want to show you who Tucker Carlson is and what he spends his time on, okay? This is Tucker Carlson. You remember this, um, this crazy 1994 racist uh, named uh, Murray who wrote The Bell Curve? You remember him? He used pseudoscientists and, and, and uh, scientists who then we later found out were part of like Nazi groups and white supremacist groups to say that black people were inherently inferior to white people and they just couldn't learn. He interviewed him this week. If you have, well, I have the data in the book. Essentially, you have registered nurses. And uh, we have data on fairly large numbers of registered nurses, black and white. And the difference in mean IQ between the two of those oh my God. is a dozen IQ points, which is a lot. It means you have a whole lot of extremely able black nurses. You have some incompetent white nurses, but it does mean you have a difference in job performance. And that's eventually going to be reflected in income as well. It's going to be reflected in the nature of their careers and the nature of uh, how they end up and so forth. Same thing goes with uh, virtually all kinds of jobs. The same thing goes for the kinds of jobs people end up in, uh, so that you have entry into certain kinds of occupations is limited because the cognitive demands of those occupations mean that a whole lot of more white people qualify than black people, and even a higher proportion of Asian people qualify than white people. These are all differences which are driven not by irrational racism. They are driven by day-to-day -day realities of job performance and the responses of supervisors to job performances and the demands of the market. That is a very sick and twisted racist man. Did he just say science tells us black people are dumber so you can pay them less? Uh, here. Why are they so mad at you? Well, race is the third rail, and it always has been, uh, of American politics. If nobody wants to talk about differences in races, you know. Nobody wants to believe that there are any differences that cannot be fixed by better education, better nutrition, less poverty, and the rest well, of it. Well, we just ask you to pause there. I, and by the way, I'd love to, you know, I'd rather not, rather not talk about race at all. I, I don't like the topic. I hear the ah. opposite, though. I hear what the leaders of the left or whatever this revolutionary movement is called saying is that the differences are so profound that they define us completely. The differences are all that matters. They seem to be emphasizing the differences. Well, the, but that's in the context of systemic racism. This is the sickest, most twisted channel that has ever come down the pike. And I include OAN, which is just complete fantasy, okay? Uh, this man, Charles Murray, who wrote The Bell Curve in 1994, has been pushing this IQ thing that has been debunked 18,400,922 times. There is no difference in the ability to learn between the races, all of them. Access to opportunity, having your neighborhoods burned down like Tulsa or the Jacksonville, at separate but equal, racism, discrimination. Holy crap! Mary had a little man, man, man. The fault. We believe that all men are created equal. To the magnificent mosaic that is America. From radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream. Change has come to America. Believe me. Help is on the way. Knock, knock. Who's there? Hey. It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Road Show. Turn up your mind. All right, so this is uh, Biden signing the bill to make Juneteenth a federal holiday, which we all have like five minutes to plan now. <laughs> there it is. 
<laughs> June 19th will be a federal holiday. I believe it'll be the 12th federal holiday in the United States of America, the first federal holiday since ML King Day. Mr. President, is Election Day next? Is the plan to sign Election Day a national holiday? All right. Thank you, everybody. Wow, Frederica Wilson really dressed up. Okay, so I just wanted you to witness that uh, because you won't be able to take off of work until I think 2023 for Juneteenth because it falls on a Saturday this year and a Sunday next year. So 2023, everybody, woohoo, let's uh, plan the four day weekend. But yeah, this is great. Uh, and this was uh, something that Sheila Jackson Lee has worked on for, oh, about 20 years. So good on her. Really good on her. So we now have an emancipation day in this here country while Tucker Carlson continues to interview the likes of Charles Murray, the disgraced, the, 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 the debunked social scientist and continues to put out false, fake, bad, lying information about the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol to an audience that just laps this crap up. And we then want to know, why are we so divided? Why are we so divided? Why isn't America, uh, you know, down with, uh, you know, investing in ourselves? How come we can't agree on an infrastructure package when we know Grids are breaking, bridges are falling down, rivers are filthy. Uh, you know, we need, uh, you know, some sort of uh, reinvestment in American uh, 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 potholes. We can't agree on that. It's because of this crap that passes as news and no regulations on them to comport with standard accepted journalistic practices. Before you brand yourself news, you ought to have to go through some certification process with, I don't know, the Columbia School of Journalism or, or, or other authorities in journalistic practices. But, oh, no, we can't have that in this country. We can't have that. Meanwhile, he keeps on telling people different things about the cause of the insurrection. First, he says it was Antifa. Then he says it wasn't even an insurrection. It was just a protest that got out of hand. And now they're telling their audience that the reason why uh, you know there are unindicted co-conspirators uh, means that it was an FBI false flag plot. Alex Jones much? I mean, how is it getting this crazy? And by the way, this isn't even peak crazy. Peak crazy, I'm about to play you, okay? I just first wanted the reaction from Michael Fanone, a police officer who was tased three times, beaten by, uh, you know, these insurrectionists, beaten mercilessly. I mean, just be, and, and, and now being denied that that even happened to him by various members of Congress who watch Fox News. There's a conspiracy theory out there on the right at this moment that this was an FBI insider operation and it's baseless, it's a lie but it's getting an assist from the right-wing media that you're talking about. And I wonder, you know, I'm talking about Fox. What is your message to hosts who I at least have no doubt that they know that this is crap, but they're saying it anyways. Right. What is your message to them? Uh, I've never been approached about doing any uh, media appearances on Fox News. Uh, I would love to do an appearance on any show on Fox News and I would challenge any of the 21 members that voted uh, against the gold medal bill acknowledging police officers that have a skewed uh, view or just plain lying about January 6th to come on those shows and talk to me uh, and listen to my experience and, and uh, what you know hundreds of other officers went through on January 6th at the insurrection. Just saying, Fox News viewers don't ever hear the truth. Capitol Police officer that did the shooting actually appeared, appeared to be hiding, lying in wait, and they gave no warning before killing her. Qu 
Question again. Why hasn't that officer that executed Ashley Babbitt been named oh when God. police officers around the country are routinely identified after a shooting? Ashley Babbitt, to be clear, was crawling through, and it's on video, a broken window into the Speaker's lobby near a number of members of the House of Representatives with a crowd of rioters behind her. The MPD Internal Affairs, as well as the DOJ, looked at this. They cleared the officer who shot her in April. I wonder what you think hearing that congressman describing her as being executed by a cop. Um, this is the congressman whose siblings put out like campaign ads asking people not to vote for him. That's right. I mean, I think those statements are moronic. Um, and I also find it ironic that, uh, you know, while a lot of members of his party um, were talking about why we didn't shoot everybody in the head that day, hmm. uh, that he would be taking, you know, the opposite, uh, opposite approach and calling a police officer a murderer. What do you think this says? I mean, we're here talking about just incredible disinformation, denial of reality yep. about what happened when it's so clear there's so much video. You couldn't get more video. You couldn't have more pictures of what happened to tell you what happened personal experiences, accounts like yours, people speaking out. What does it tell you about the future of the country that we cannot seem to see eye to eye on just basic verifiable facts? Yeah, I mean, I think that's like one of the issues, you know, that's uh, most disturbing to me is the degree of tribalism in this country. Um, you know, and we've been heading in this direction now for quite some time. Uh, and it's just gotten to like an unbearable point. Um, I mean, it's, it's sad because I know lots of people who source their news from one particular uh, news network and they don't have any appreciation for what happened on January 6th. Um, and then when I talk to them or show them body-worn camera, they're absolutely floored. I mean, stunned. Their minds are changed? Oh, I mean, the, the ones that I'm close with, absolutely. Yes, ma'am. But they wouldn't know. I mean, if you only listen to a handful of representatives that go back to their districts and talk a bunch of bullshit about January 6th, and then you source your news from some, uh, you know, specific news networks, you're not going to know. You're going to have no idea. They're going to have no idea. They're not going to know what really happened. They're not going to know reality. They're, they're, they're never going to see the videos of... Michael Fanon being beaten. They're never going to see the videos of people throwing fire extinguishers at police officers. They're never going to see the videos of police officers being crushed with a group of protesters, a group of insurrectionists behind them going, heave, ho, heave, ho, heave, ho, and police officers screaming, help, help. They're never going to know that. They're never going to see that. They're never going to experience what really happened on January 6th. That is bizarre. That is why this country is splitting apart. That is why people can't agree on the basic, basic truths of what we need and what should be done and voting and infrastructure and health care. I mean, it's so nefarious. It's so ugly. And that's not even peak crazy. Okay, you would think that the insurrection was peak crazy. No, 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 no. The big lie is peak crazy. And I'm gonna show you something that is going on with the mess in Maricopa. Looking for Chinese bamboo in ballots. Oh, wait, wait, it's moved now from Maricopa County to Montana. All things Randy at randyroads.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. Are you ready for peak crazy? Okay, this is it. Watch this. On this piece of property in a remote part of Montana, people may at this very minute be analyzing voting data from the state of Arizona as part of the so-called Arizona audit run by the Cyber Ninjas, a company whose CEO had previously espoused Trump-style election conspiracy theories. Oh. What does Montana have to do with all this? Ken Bennett is a spokesman for the audit. Everything that uh, Cyber Ninjas is doing, they're either doing with their own expertise or the expertise of the people that they're hired. And a contractor it hired is called Cypher LLC. 
Bennett says Cypher was permitted to take copies of Arizona voting system data on a truck and have it driven to Montana. Oh my God. Where it's being, quote, forensically evaluated in what he described as a secure, powerful laboratory. But nobody is publicly saying what that actually means. And Bennett tells us he doesn't know where the so-called lab is. It is apparently a secret. So as you might expect, we're left wondering where in the state of Montana are the copies of this voting data being analyzed? Where is the secure, powerful lab? Here's what we found out. Cypher is a company that's based in Virginia, according to its website. But Cypher was spun off and is a sister company of a company called SciTech. And SciTech, according to its website, is based in Montana. Here we are right now, south of the city of Big Four. More interestingly, SciTech and Cypher are run by the same exact person. And that person, we're told, is the man who drove in a truck the copies of the voting information from Arizona to Montana. So this property where SciTech, according to the website, is located, also happens to be, according to records, where the CEO lives, his residence. So could the information be here? We can tell you as we walk up here, the first thing you see on this big piece of land is a sign, private property, trespassing for any purpose is strictly forbidden, violators will be prosecuted. So we can't cross this area. We can show you though from this area, what looks like a cabin on this property. Is this the secure, powerful laboratory? Is Arizona voting data inside that cabin? We just don't know. Oh my God. This is peak crazy. So it wasn't bad enough that the Senate president, who is a member of ALEC, who is receiving money from the Koch brothers, actually was able to allow for the hiring of a company with no expertise whatsoever in elections, Cyber Ninjas in Florida, with a CEO who is pro-conspiracy theory about fraud, that the election was stolen from Donald Trump, to be in charge of a private audit of Maricopa County's 2.1 million ballots, but now he subcontracted to another company that is based in Montana in a cabin located outside of Big Fork, Montana, gorgeous, but located outside of Big Fork, Montana. A, the guy, his name is Ben Cotton. He owns SciTech. He's the CEO of SciTech. He is now picking up copies of the data, of the ballots, getting in a truck, and himself driving the data on those ballots to his cabin outside of Big Fork, Montana, telling people it's some sort of a super lab, and he's going to forensically look at the data in his lab in Montana without telling anybody what security measures are in place, where the lab is, whether or not objective observers are allowed. I mean, nobody even knows where this lab is because there isn't a lab. It's his freaking cabin. And we know this because when CNN was prohibited from entering the property, couldn't pass the property line, uh, they decided to check it out by air. The boss who drove the truck to Montana, according to the audit spokesman, is Ben Cotton, who testified in a special meeting at the Arizona Capitol last month. I personally have over 25 years of computer forensics and incident response experience. We reached out to Cotton to ask him about what kind of analysis is taking place and is his lab on his property. He did not respond. Oh. So we did some further investigating from the air. And we see that in addition to the building that looks like a cabin, there is on the right a large house in the clearing, and on the left what looks like a barn and perhaps some trailers, but no people. A real estate website shows what appears to be that large house, nice. and it all sits on 155 acres of land. So there is plenty of space here for a lab, and plenty of privacy for the boss. You can't make this. Arizona's Democratic Secretary of State says she's very concerned about what's going on nearly 1,300 miles north of Phoenix. If it wasn't happening right in front of our eyes, we wouldn't believe it was happening. Is there a deadline for finishing this Montana analysis? According to the Arizona audit spokesman, no deadline. When it's done, it's done. 
Okay, this is peak crazy. This is insane. First of all, we have a federal law that says you must preserve ballots for 22 months after an election. Second, we've got cyber ninjas fingering those ballots and saying that they're nearly done. And then now the data is being stolen. The data is being put into a truck that is being driven by a man named Ben Cotton to his cabin, to his cabin, without any observers or guarantees of security or any information about what what measures are in place or what is the lab supposed to do with this data or how long will it be in possession of these uh, of this data nothing has been told to the secretary of state of arizona nothing has been told to the person who's supposed to be in charge of observing it this bennett dude from uh, you know the secretary of state uh uh ken bennett he's the liaison between cyber ninjas and the Senate uh, president, Karen Fan. I mean, they asked the Secretary of State in Arizona if he had any documentation <clears throat> on the Montana lab that would indicate that the lab was secure, and he said he hadn't seen any documentation. But Doug Logan from Cyber Ninjas here in Florida says... I trust Ben Cotton at his word with all this data. So now you've got lunatics who have complete unfettered access to the data of Arizona voters, and we don't really know what data do they have. Is it private voter information? Is it voter registration information? If it's voter registration information, then they have your party affiliation and they have your address and ID numbers, maybe even driver's license ID numbers. I mean, there is nothing here from both a security or a privacy perspective that guarantees the safe handling of personal voter data. No policies, no processes related to this partisan review are available. No one knows where they plan to send this data or what they plan to use this data for. All we know is that these people, Ben Cotton and Logan, say they are a for-profit business and they've signed non-disclosure agreements and they're not talking about anything. You realize this is obviously how a foreign government could get voter data? You, you understand that that's possible, right? Call in, connect. To speak to Randy, call 561-270-3844. 561-270-3844. When we look at what has happened in Texas, we look at what's happening around the country, I think it's important to remember, we talk about the right to vote. Um, and the right to vote is a given. All citizens have the right to vote constitutionally. It is their right. What we are seeing are examples of an attempt to interfere with that right, an attempt to marginalize and take from people a right that has already been given. We are not asking for the bestowal of a right. We are talking about the preservation of a right. That is the right of citizenship. And it's that fundamental. It is that fundamental. We will do everything in our power as an administration to lift up the voices of those who seek to preserve the right of the people to vote. We're not telling people how to vote. And frankly, this is not a Democratic or a Republican issue. This is an American issue. This is an American issue. So apparently uh, we are at the precipice of being able to pass voting rights legislation. And that's why I want to show you how crazy, how crazy the right wing is about the idea that you would be able to vote. They don't like it. Their numbers are diminishing. People aren't buying anything that they're selling. Their policies have failed over and over again. Redistribution of wealth, reverse socialism, autocracy, oligarchy, whatever you want to call it, kleptocracy. Uh, that is what the Republicans are about. And 
we need a federal law put in place to prevent things like legislatures having the awesome power to overrule what the people voted for. I told you they do it all the time now, and they do it in a stealthy way. I told you about Missouri. Missouri voted, and it passed overwhelmingly, to expand Medicaid into Missouri. The Republican legislature didn't like what the voters of Missouri had chosen for themselves in a self-governance vote, and so they chose not to fund it, even though the money was coming from the federal government. Now you see what's going on in Arizona, where they don't like the results of an election. Not their election, their election was fine members of the Arizona legislature. They were on the ballot too. They have no problem with the results for themselves. They have a problem with the president. And so they have farmed out to a for-profit company with zero election experience, a privately funded or publicly funded private company audit, even though there were two audits done in that same county And those audits produced zero evidence of fraud. And now they're taking and stealing the voter data, the voter data. And I don't even know how far reaching the data is. Is it into the registrations? What data does this man in Montana, uh, what was he driving from Arizona to Montana with to his cabin? And is it for sale? Because data is a marketplace, you know that. People will buy your data. Who is buying this data? Why are they taking the data? What data is there? How personal is it? Uh, Does it go down to names and party affiliations? Does it go down to names and addresses? Does it go down to driver's license? I mean, we'd have no idea what they're doing with information on Arizona voters in Montana in a cabin and outside of uh, Big Fork. So we need federal legislation and we need it badly. So yesterday I told you that Joe Manchin had put out his proposal to take out some of the stuff that HR1 sought to address, like campaign financing. That is the big objection from uh, people who are totally into donor money, like totally into being paid to legislate. Joe Manchin is one of those. And so he put out his list of things he could agree to in HR1 if you took out uh, federal uh, financing of campaigns, if you took out public financing of campaigns, and if you took out, uh, you know, uh, uh, some of the uh, gerrymandering, uh, you know, by computer, if you took out and you added voter ID, although he's willing to say that a utility bill could serve as valid ID. So, you know, if you took, if if you put that in there, if you made election day a public holiday, if you, you know, did 15 days of early voting, if you did certain things, he, he, he could, you know, vote for it. He could, he could be down with it. And now HR1 stands a chance However, we still don't have 60 votes. We still don't have 10 Republicans. All this machina- all of this negotiating that Joe Manchin is doing is negotiating with his own freaking party, with his own party. And we still don't have 10 Republicans who would pass a federal law that creates a floor under which you cannot sink in order to rig elections in the state, in order to gerrymander them, in order to uh, end early voting, in order to prevent Sunday souls to the polls. Oh, that couldn't possibly have anything to do with race, could it? No. And so Joe Manchin has been negotiating against his own party. Well, let me let me just sh- there there are people that are saying we should go down with uh, Joe Manchin's uh, you know compromise that we should sign on to it. 
Well, even if I said, okay, I won't do campaign finance reform, which is the cause of all of our problems, all of our problems, I guarantee you whatever your issue is, whatever your problem is, whatever you're concerned about, if you follow the money, you will figure out who is funding it so that you can't, so that 98% of Americans can't see background checks on guns or that, you know, 79% of West Virginia uh, can't have an infrastructure package that they're all for. Just follow the money. Well, that's what makes this Intercept article so interesting. It was interesting to me because I know this group. I, I, I literally know them, know them. I've been to dinner at this group's house in Washington, D.C. But The Intercept was able to get a copy, or at least I don't know if they were invited. They're not very clear about it, but they were able to show you, they say it's leaked, a Zoom call, a Zoom call of Senator Joe Manchin on the phone with billionaire donors, with billionaire donors, the Zoom call was hosted by a group called No Labels. I know them. <laughs> this is the Randy Rhodes Show. To speak with Randy, dial 561-270-3844. That's 561-270-3844. All right, this is it. This is the last Thursday of the Summer Pledge Drive. Yay! And it's a triple, triple impact day. It's a really good one. It's a good one to donate, right? Any donation made today will be doubled up to $5,000. Thanks to Bob and Carol in Oregon. They are Free Speech TV frontline funders. And if you do that, it will help us get to our ultimate financial goal by tomorrow and we, when we do that, then we'll get an additional $5,000 donation from Sandy and um, Stuart. Yes, sorry. Sandy, I just had a brain fart. Sandy and Stuart in California. So it's a triple impact day, right? Anything you do today gets doubled uh, by uh, Carol and Bob in Oregon. And then that helps us add to the total. And then when we reach the goal total tomorrow, which I feel good about, then we'll get the extra $5,000 from the frontline funders uh, in California, uh, Sandy and Stewart. okay? So anyway, all you need to know is triple donation day is what it is. 877-378-8669. Thank you very much for calling that number. Or just go online, freespeech.org, freespeech.org, freespeech.org. Thank you, thank you. Mike in Colorado. Hey, Randy, how are you? Good, how are you? Second time caller, so I'm going to make it quick. I know it's the end of the fun drive. I always donate when there's a double match. Yay. So today there was a triple match. I had to do it again. Yeah, oh, Bobby Cole. Thank you. So... Where's Ted and Alice? Yes. So, <laughs> Bobby yeah. Carroll, where's Ted and Alice? Uh, there's Sandy yeah. and Stewart. <laughs> I want to talk to um, all the lazy liberals who sit around and watch you guys all day long and never donate. I know there's a whole bunch of them um, who got plenty of money to do it. They well, just got to get up and do it the first time. Yeah, the people who have plenty of money to do it, what's wrong with you? And the people who don't, I get it. You know what I mean? It's fine. It's fine. Enjoy. It's free. We're independent, and we're here for you every single day. So if you right. can Well, I'm on the edge, and every time there's a matching donation, that guy in San Francisco is my hero, and I help Stuart and Sandy come to their senses and kick it in regardless of what happens. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it very, very much. David in San Francisco. Oh, hi, Randy. Long time no talk. Hey, if I remember right, your husband's uh, a lawyer. And Obvious. It would, yeah, it would seem to me that uh, there could be some lawsuits against this uh, ninja group uh, for damaging public property. Uh, I've heard, uh, I was listening to Stephanie Miller's show, and she was talking about, uh, was it potentially the city uh, is going to have to buy $6 million worth of brand new uh, voting equipment because it's been compromised? Yes. And so 
I mean, just damaging public property seems like a real easy uh, lawsuit, if not uh, maybe some criminal uh, uh, charges as well. So, uh, you know, since these uh, so-called neocons uh, or fake conservatives believe in market forces, uh, how about some market forces on their uh, on their asses? Because they're costing the taxpayer six million dollars to replace the voting machines, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And there's also a federal law that says that you must preserve ballots for 22 months after an election. Obviously, they didn't preserve anything, you know, without uh, w- w- with the proper security. I mean, they didn't even list like any of the security measures or. Uh, you know, uh, a procedure that they're following. I mean, it, this is just, that's why I said this is peak crazy. Uh, now, when you, you bring up Howard, How, Howard is a retired lawyer lobbyist. Retired lawyer lobbyist. But that brings me to this, which is where we went into the break. This is how I know the people that were on the phone with Joe Manchin, the billionaire donors. Okay, the billionaire donors were according to The Intercept, who was able to get the video and the audio from this Zoom call. The billionaires were Louis Bacon, the chief executive of Moore Capital Management, Kenneth Tuckman, the founder of Global Outsourcing for Teletech. Global outsourcing, a global outsourcing company called Teletech. Uh, Howard Marks, the head of Oak Tree Capital, one of the the largest private equity firms in this country, The Zoom call log included a dial-in from Tudor Investment Corporation. That's a hedge fund founded by Paul Tudor Jones. And also present was uh, a whole bunch of uh, influencers, Republican consultant Ron Christie, Joe Lieberman, who is, he is the representative uh, that they put on the masthead, let's say, of no labels. But Joe Lieberman, you might remember as the vice presidential candidate for Al Gore, a man who I spoke to the the day that I went to vote in 2000, and I actually had his phone number because I had spoken to his wife the night before Hadassah on my show, and so I had contact information for the Liebermans, and I called him and I said, something's wrong. I went to vote, and I think I might have voted for Pat Buchanan. And Joe Lieberman's response to me that day was, it will be fine. And of course, you know that Al Gore won that election, but the Supreme Court said, stop counting the votes in Florida, and we got eight years of W and wars. Well, anyway, the, the person who actually founded No Labels, I know Joe Lieberman is like the head of it now, or, or you know, they put his name out there as being, you know, a go to. It's Nancy Jacobson who, and her husband, Mark Penn. Now, Mark Penn, I don't know if you remember him or not, but he's a political consultant. He's also a big lawyer. He used to work for a big, uh, you know, a big law firm. And his wife, Nancy Jacobson, they started No Labels. What No Labels does is it gets all these billionaire donors together, high net worth individual donor money, and they give to conservative Democrats and Republicans. It's what they do. Now, I've been to their house. They invited Howard to dinner once, and I happened to be the girl. Now, I think they understood, you know, back then, you know, they understood that I was a national radio host and blah, 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 and where I lived and breathed was not in their wheelhouse. Uh, But when I went to their townhouse, the Ungapachka, the over the top, the art collection alone. I was just sickened, okay? I mean, the amount of money that they bundle to influence politics. So it's not just the Koch brothers, and it's not just Americans for Prosperity. You know? But this is who Joe Manchin was on the phone with when The Intercept was able to get the audio of Joe Manchin's call with these billionaires who were all donors, right? And what Joe Manchin was telling them was that Mitch McConnell's obstruction on the January 6th commission to look into the insurrection, which is where we started with Tucker Carlson, denying that there even is 
an insurrection to look into, saying that it's an FBI false flag plot. And before that, it was an Antifa plot. And before that, they and then in the middle somewhere, everybody was well behaved and they don't know what we're talking about. Well, that's why we need a January 6th commission. And Manchin was for it. OK, he was for a January 6th commission. And when the when Mitch McConnell made it clear to Joe Manchin that he was calling in personal favors, personal favors, and telling all the Republicans to obstruct the creation of an independent January 6th commission, Joe Manchin was talking about this on this phone call, and he said the reason why that was so upsetting to him was because it proved that bipartisanship doesn't exist anymore, even on something so basic as the attempted overthrow of our government needing to have a little look-see by an independent commission. And so he's on this phone call telling these donors, telling them that they need to, you know, he doesn't solicit money. And, and, and this is, this is the, the key to, you know, whether or not he broke the law. If he... He was in his Senate office making this call. He was. Now, one of the few laws we have is you can't be in your Senate office trolling for dollars. That's why they have to leave and go to Charlie Palmer's for these fundraisers. That's why they have to leave and go to cocktail parties. That's why they have to leave and go across the street, right? They, they can't do it from their office. Well, he was talking on this phone call in his office, but he didn't actually blatantly solicit dollars. So... They're saying, oh, he didn't violate any of the ethics rules. But what he's saying is to these billionaires, you need to start giving money. You need to start helping, not just money, but you need to promise like a retiring guy like Roy Blunt of Missouri. You're going to deal with him in his next life, right? You need to give him employment. 